So this is the start of a three-part video series we're doing all about watts. In the first part, we're going to talk about wattage as it relates to the power required to move a bicycle. In the second part, we're going to look at wattage in terms of electric motors, how many watts motors can produce continuously and for short durations of time. And finally, in part three, we're going to discuss the rather Byzantine world of wattage ratings as they apply to the regulations that surround e-bikes. So even if you don't have an electrical or an engineering background, you're certainly familiar with the words watts and how it applies in the real world. All around us, we're dealing with electrical devices that are rated by their power. The typical LED light bulbs in this room might draw 10 to 15 watts of power. This laptop sitting in front of me has a 60 watt power adapter to charge it. If I have a full desktop computer, that draws around 200 watts. When I'm in the wood shop using the drill press or a belt sander, each of those tools draws something like 400 watts of power. If I'm in the kitchen using the toaster, that might be putting 800 watts. A microwave could be 800 to 1000 watts. And the full kitchen range might even need a 3000 watt connection to the wall. So those examples are all related to electricity. And in electric devices, wattage is really easy to measure. It's just the volts times the amps flowing into the circuit. But anything else in the world around us that generates power can also be characterized in watts. An engine horsepower, for instance, is just under 750 watts. Now a human being, which very much relates to the topic here, can also be a generator that produces power. So an average person pedaling a bike or rowing a boat or going for a jog can easily put out somewhere between 80 to 150 watts of power on a continuous basis. Most people can do 200 to 300 watts for short times like 5 to 10 minutes before tiring themselves out. And if you're being chased by a bear in a full life or death sprint, it's quite easy to put out 500 to 7 or even 800 watts, making a full horsepower out of a human, but that's an adrenaline fueled very short duration excursion. The power that goes into moving a bicycle gets dissipated into four different places. The first of these is rolling friction. This is power that's used to overcome the frictional drag between the tire and the contact with the ground. Now in general, the rolling frictional losses are going to increase with the weight of the vehicle. So if you double the weight of the rider, you're going to double the amount of watts that goes into friction. And they also increase with the speed of the vehicle. So if you double the speed, you double how many watts are needed to overcome that friction. The second major component for dissipating the watts in a vehicle is air drag. So air drag is all the turbulence of the atmosphere that flows around the person in the vehicle as they move through the air. Air resistance has a property that it increases with the cube of your bicycle speed. So if you're moving at double the speed, you actually have eight times more power being lost to air drag. The air drag also increases with your frontal area. So if you're laid down in a tuck position or riding a recumbent bike, there's less frontal area exposed to the atmosphere and that brings down the air drag in proportion to that area. Next up is gravity. So when you're riding a bicycle up a hill, a lot of the power that you're putting into the bicycle isn't going to rolling friction or to air friction. It's actually going to increase the potential energy of you of a rider as you rise against gravity and increase your elevation. And finally, if the total power going into the bike is more than the power needed to overcome air drag, rolling drag, and gravity, that remaining power goes into increasing the kinetic energy of the bike. So you accelerate. And as you accelerate, more and more energy gets stored in your built-in velocity. Now the first two of these items, your air drag and your rolling friction, are lost causes. As soon as power is put into any of those frictional sources, you can never get it back again. But gravity and kinetic energy are both conservative entities. The power that you put into climbing a hill is available to use coasting downhill on the return trip. And similarly, any power that you use to accelerate your vehicle to go faster is now available to use for coasting or deceleration down the road. So if you start plotting this, things can get pretty interesting. So here we have a basic graph of the amount of power required to push an average sized rider on an average mountain bike on flat ground with no wind. You can see at low speeds, 10 kilometers an hour, we only need 30 watts to move the vehicle. At 20 kilometers an hour, we need 105, 110 watts, I should say. Um, as we move up to 30 kilometers an hour, that speed increases to over 280 watts. To move the bike at 40 kilometers an hour, we now need over 600 watts of power. So there's this large increase as the velocity increases. You can see that in this plot, we've divided the losses due to rolling resistance compared to the losses due to air resistance. And at these very low speeds, 10 kilometers an hour, more than 75% of that energy of that 30 watts goes into the tire friction. Meanwhile, at 40 kilometers an hour, the situation is more or less inverted. 
we have only 14% of the energy is going into the rolling drag and 86% is overcoming air resistance. So now what happens if we change the situation a little bit? Let's switch from a mountain bike tire to a higher pressure road tire. So that would be reducing the coefficient of friction between the tire. Let's go from 0.008 to 0.004. And now we can see there is a very slight reduction across the entire speed range. In fact, what I'll do is open a second simulation so we can pair these two things side to side. Now if we change the weight of the rider, that also has a small effect on this overall plot. So if I go from a 100 kilo rider to say somebody weighs 150 kilograms, you can see that now the power is slightly higher across the whole speed range, but not a huge difference. If instead of changing the weight, we look at changing the aerodynamics, we expect a much more significant variation here. So if I go from an upright mountain bike to riding in a full recumbent vehicle, now you can see a very dramatic shift in the amount of power needed to go at any given speed. So if we compare the plot at 40 kilometers an hour, the upright bike here needs 560 watts and the recumbent bike is only 300 watts, so roughly half as much. So it's very easy to see in this simple plot exactly how fast the bike will go with a given amount of power. And it really doesn't matter one bit if that power is coming from an electric motor or from someone's legs. But in the real world, it's quite rare that you're only riding on flat ground in totally still air. Any city, especially one like Vancouver, is full of hills going up and down, and we deal with winds, headwinds, crosswinds, and sidewinds that have a big effect on the drag resistance of the vehicle. So let's actually start diving into those results a little bit, because they're rarely covered in the high-level discussions about bicycle power. So let's start off with headwinds and tailwinds. So anyone who's ever gone bike touring knows full well the crazy demoralizing effect that a constant headwind can have all day long on your progress. So let's just imagine a 20 km per hour breeze, that's windy enough that you could fly a kite and you could go out sailing, but it's not what you would call a strong wind, maybe just a light breezy day. 20 kilometer an hour headwind. Now look at the dramatic difference in this plot. So for a rider putting out just 100 watts of human power, instead of cruising along at 20 kilometers an hour, the speed has now been reduced to 10 kilometers an hour. If we look at how hard it is to go at a given speed, let's just say a rider wants to travel at 30 kilometers an hour, well, with the 20 kilometer hour headwind, you can see that we need 660 watts of power in order to maintain 30 kilometers an hour. And that compares to 285 watts that we saw with no wind. Now let's say that you have a 20 kilometer an hour tailwind. So rather than you going head on, it's coming at you from behind. With the tailwind, in order to do 30 kilometers an hour, you only need a measly 90 watts of power from the leg. You'll have no problem at all sustaining that. And the difference in power between riding into the wind or with the wind is almost 500 watts. So that's the effective advantage somebody has when they're riding in the opposite direction as you facing the headwind. And this gets even more dramatic when you talk about an actually windy day. So let's change that from a 20 kilometer hour wind to 40 kilometers an hour. That's 25 miles an hour. And it's the kind of wind that results in sort of gale force warnings uh, out on the ocean, but it's nothing unusual to experience in what you call a windy day. So in this situation, look at the massive difference in these curves between riding into the wind and riding with the wind. Um, if you're wondering why the with the wind graph goes negative here, that's actually because the tailwind will push you with no pedal effort at all right up to 20 kilometers an hour. And then as you start pedaling, you go faster and faster and faster. To go 30 kilometers an hour with this tailwind, you only need 42 watts of power coming out of your legs. But to do 30 kilometers an hour into this headwind, we now need uh, 1,250 watts. Way more than any human is capable of putting out for any length of time at all. So you can see that at the low power output that a human's able to produce, the effect of wind is massive on how fast the bicycle ends up cruising. The other important detail that's often overlooked when people talk about bicycle power is the effect of the grade hill. And this is someone everyone is intimately familiar with because going uphill is strenuous, hard, and slow. Let's look at what that looks like quantitatively with these graphs. So in this graph, I've plotted the speed as a function of the percent grade that you'll go up a hill at 100, 200, and 300 watts of human power. You can see that as we get into double digit grades, the speed drops precipitously low. In fact, we're less than five kilometers an hour going up a 10% grade hill and it drops down to under three kilometers an hour if we're only putting out 100 watts. 
These are unsafe speeds for staying stable on a bicycle. And anyone who's run into this situation will usually hop off the bike and push it because it's not easy to stay pedaling at such a low speed. On the flip side, what happens when you're going downhill and gravity is feeding you power rather than absorbing power? We often talk about the amount of power and the slow speed struggling to climb a hill, but we rarely discuss in wattage terms how much power we're getting from gravity as we cruise fast on a downhill grade. So here I've shown a plot showing percent grade in the opposite direction, in a downhill grade. And you can see, not surprisingly, that bicycles go crazy fast when coasting downhill. On a 10% grade, this particular combination gives us 58 kilometers an hour. Now the human's legs may be putting out 100 watts, but they're getting over 1,700 watts of power from gravity. In fact, the action of pedaling is likely causing more air resistance from the feet than is being generated from the human's output. You would go faster just crouching your legs up than trying to pedal and contribute more energy going down a grade like this. If we take it right to a 14% grade hill, now we coast down at 68 kilometers an hour with a staggering 2.7 kilowatts of power coming from gravity fueling that descent. Finally, we're gonna talk about the effects of vehicle weight on all of these power situations. Now the weight of a vehicle has no direct effect on the air drag, which is the main force of power needed when you're talking about riding a bike on flat ground. But it does increase the rolling resistance and it has a dramatic effect on climbing hills or going down hills, as you would expect. So let's look at weight from the perspective of a cargo bike. Imagine a standard bike with a rider is about 100 kilograms. Let's add an extra 150 kilos as a cargo load that they're carrying. So 250 kilos total weight or 550 pounds. Riding on flat ground with no winds, a rider who can put out 200 watts with their legs will be able to move this cargo bike at 22 kilometers an hour. Quite a nice speed to travel around town. But the moment they start hitting hills, things fall down precipitously. If you hit a 5% grade hill, that same 200 watts of power is only going to move the bike along at a measly 5 kilometers an hour. If that hits a 10% grade hill, now you're cruising at less than 3 kilometers an hour, a speed that's barely stable on most two-wheeled bicycles. Let's just say that this cargo bike rider wanted to climb that 10% grade hill at that same comfortable safe speed of 22 kilometers an hour. In addition to the 200 watts from their legs, they're going to need to somehow muster another 1500 watts of power from some other source in order to maintain the same speed that their legs could do on the flats for 1700 watts in total. So if we look at this in the perspective of a real world bicycle trip, the human body is able to continuously put out somewhere between 100 and 200 watts of steady power. Now that power moves the bicycle at radically different speeds depending on the percent grade hill, the wind conditions and the weight. So you might be cruising at 20 to 25 kilometers an hour when the ground's flat, but the speed might slow down enormously climbing a hill to single digit 5, 6, 7 kilometers an hour. While climbing that hill, you're effectively storing all the power that you're putting in against gravity to use again on the downhill stretches. And while coasting fast downhill, you're getting thousands of watts of power from that stored gravitational energy. The presence of any headwinds or tailwinds greatly shifts this entire vehicle speed dynamic, much more than the magnitude at which human power levels can vary.